Hi there, Fiber friends. Welcome to the Fiber Artist Podcast, and thank you for tuning in today. I've got a great episode for you. And today's guest is the bold, brazen queen of fuckrame, Terry Watson of Taiwan On Creative. Yes, you heard right. So this isn't the one to listen to with your young kids in the car, but for adults, here we are. Thank you for staying on. You might know Terry's work from Instagram. Grids and grids of vertical clove hitches depicting phrases like, where are my scissors or or zero given. Oh my God, this is so therapeutic. Ah, Thank you, Terry, for letting us all vent a little. Terry has a brand new book out called New School Macrame, where you can learn all her vertical clove hitch ways and make your own phrases. Cursing is optional. New School Macrame is available where most books are sold, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, etc. And you can find Terry online at taiwanoncreative.com and on Instagram at taiwanoncreative. Okay, that's it for now. I hope you enjoy the episode. Please take a moment to introduce <laughs> yourself. Just give people your first and last name, where they can find you on the interwebs or on Instagram or sure. TikTok or wherever you want them to find you. Yeah, TED Talk someday. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Hell yeah. First Mac or TED Talk. Uh, <laughs> uh, my name is Terry Watson. I am a fiber, fiber artist, have been for many, many, many years. Um, I learned the fine art of macrame from my grandmother when I was about eight, when she realized that knitting and crochet were really outside my wheelhouse, and I was pretty hopeless at both of those <laughs> things. So she took away all the implements and said, okay, well, just use your hands. We'll see if this works. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I've been doing macrame for a long time. It definitely fell out of my life for a number of years, you know, mm -hmm. once you kind of reach adulthood and you need to make that money and pay those bills. Um, crafting kind of took took a bit of a backseat during, you know, a couple of decades. But totally. um, I was living in Australia um, five or six years ago and uh, decided that I needed, you know, something else to do on the days when there were no waves and, you know, things like that. So I... I uh, signed up for a macrame course, not really understanding that what I used to do was macrame because grandma never really called it that. It was right. just like, you know, friendship bracelets and jewelry and knots and things. And uh, so, so actually at the time courses. when your grandma was teaching you, like, um, what were you guys focused on, focusing on in terms of like what, what kinds of things you're making? Mostly jewelry. Like, okay, so I like mean, little, I don't little know stuff. how old you are, Cindy, but back when I was like, oh, yeah. you know, before I turned 10, it was like all the floss embroidery thread bracelets yep. and things like that yeah so, we were doing yeah, all of those fairly, totally yeah so when I signed up for this course I, I showed up I was super keen I'm like I want to make plant holders and all these things and then she, the gal started teaching the knots and I'm like oh I know this one I know this one. Oh, I know the uh, nice I know all. and it all started coming back to you <laughs> totally it was like light bulb moments one after another so um you know that was kind of my foray into macrame and then my re-entry into it and kind of during those years when I came back to it as an adult as well like I had stopped drinking and I still don't I'm like haven't in almost five years oh my but god congratulations I was doing oh thank you <laughs> yeah it was it's a good lifestyle choice I'm uh, for uh, sure never I'd never go back to that. But um, anyway, it was certainly something that, you know, I could focus my mind and my hands on. And I was listening to a lot of like quit lit podcasts and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So macrame and that kind of thing went hand in hand, like pardon the pun. But anyways, yeah, so that's kind of how it all came to be um, for the second time around. And then I started my business. Uh, it's called Tide One on Creative. Um, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook under that handle. I also have TaiwanOnCreative.com and there's like Pinterest and you know all the things. So, yeah, here awesome, we are. great intro. Now I have so many questions. Um, <laughs> do you remember who you took your course with when you were in Australia? Yes, it was a, a Kiwi gal. I'm gonna have to go back and find her Instagram handle. She's not really doing as much for me anymore because mm -hmm. she's got a she has a gaggle of children now, um, and she's doing a real good job of being a mom. So yeah. I think she has a lot less time. But yeah, her name is Taryn, okay. and uh, I, her Instagram handle escapes me. But yeah, okay. she 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 and I became very good buddies over the years. Oh, that's that, awesome! So. so why did you yeah. decide to? So are you from? You're in Canada. You're in Nova. Uh oh, we froze. Hold on one second. Okay, sorry, you froze for a second. Um, nope, that's fine. Okay, so uh, you are in Nova Scotia now, right? Yeah, so yeah, a little bit about that. 
I have lived quite a nomadic life, Cindy, over the years. Um, I was born in eastern Canada, in Nova Scotia, so kind of on the same coast that you're on. You're in mm-hmm. Jersey, right? Yeah. So over in the east. And um, my father was a federal police officer, and they get transferred around kind of like the military folks in oh. this country. So when I was 10, we got transferred to central Canada, to Ontario, and I did high school over there. And then after that, I kind of had this wild hair up my butt that I wanted to travel and do things. And I was snowboarding like crazy. So I moved to Western Canada um, after I did some time in university and decided that was not for Terry. I went and did the ski bub thing in Western Canada. And then from there, I did it in Europe for quite a while. And then I came back and um, retrained as a personal trainer. So that's kind of like my actual background is health and wellness, rehabilitative fitness, etc. But then when I relocated to Australia, uh, during those years, I was also traveling a lot for work and different things. So the personal training business went and uh, yeah, in came all sorts of other random things. So my resume is a little bit uh, lengthy and weird. It's kind, it's <laughs> but, really awesome, actually. Yeah, it's it's yeah. it's very different from a li- the lifestyle that I kind of grew up with and know, which is to be more like, um, I don't know, to stay in one place. <laughs> like I, I stayed in the same house until I was 18 years old. And then I went to college and stayed there for even another two years, even though all my friends moved to New York. And, um, you yeah. know, I just kind Where of, did and then grow up, Cindy? I'm from Michigan. What did you think in school? Oh, um, okay. yeah, I'm from Michigan. Um, and like born and raised there. And then mm-hmm. I went to, um, I went to school in Chicago at Northwestern and, um, I you know, know, I did communications cause I didn't know what else to fucking do. <laughs> <laughs> and That's and I tried to get it, I tried to get into the journalism school, which is like you know one of the top journalism schools in the country, and I didn't pass to get into it. So I was like, okay, fine, communications it is. So I yeah. partied yeah. my way through college, and you know <laughs> somehow I know that squeaked story. through. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> somehow did well, which is really uh-huh. weird. Um, and then uh, stayed in Chicago, and then yeah, and that was like the year I graduated was the year that nine uh, eleven happened. So while I was interviewing for right. jobs and all that stuff was happening, that happened, and all of a sudden the job search kind of like came to a halt, and I ended up just taking like a recruiting, like I would. So I went to a recruiter to get a job and they hired me. So they hired you. Yeah. That's happened to me before too. Yeah, right? yeah. Like, it's kind of nice. And yeah. and then and then when I was kind of done with doing that because I I was not good at it. Like I wasn't good at the sales part of being a recruiter and it was like a it was like a almost a purely commission job and it sucked a lot and I'm just not a good I'm not a great yeah. salesperson. Um so they placed me into like a marketing assistant position somewhere else and then I decided to um, apply to grad school in at NYU. And so I got it there and started my New York East Coast journey. Um, here you yeah, are. And here I am. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so my, so what I'm thinking is like, oh my God, how do you, how do you sustain a life? Like when you're wandering like that, or so you said you were a ski bum, were you teaching skiing? Like, were you working in a resort? Uh, how does like, how do you, what do you do? I did work in resorts, <laughs> yeah. but You know, like I have this other whole life of like hospitality and event work um, experience. And I still kind of foray into that here and there. Um, So I travel still a lot for work when obviously COVID isn't a thing. Um, Yeah. So I'm looking forward to kind of that kicking off again so that, you know, the nomadic itch can get scratched because the last two years, you know, while I've done a lot of really cool things, you know, like writing the book and, you know, like my business has really taken off in the last couple of years as well, because I took kind of like the fucker may route, which, you know, kind of hit home with a lot of, a lot of folks when, when I launched it. So you know, like while a lot of shitty things obviously happened during COVID, for me, there was a lot of good that came out of it too. And I like to really try and focus on that. And during those two years, I also relocated back to Nova Scotia, Mm -hmm. which is where, you know, my family is, my parents are, I haven't lived anywhere near my folks since I was like 19 years old. So, you know, that's a fair number of years ago. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) Yeah. Wait, so so what made you, so were you before the pandemic, I'm sorry to interrupt. um, No, no. You're before fine. the pandemic were you was that when you were in Australia and then and that's why yeah. like why did you decide to move back 
So I was in Australia for a few years, living the dream on the Gold Coast. It's fucking brilliant. It sounds over there. so nice. There. I like, love it. Such a dream. Yeah. And I, I'm a beach bum. Like but prior to that, I spent a number of years spending winters in Nicaragua. And, you know, like I've always kind of chased summer. Prior to that, I chased winter because like I am a bit of an extremist. And when I like something, I like it a lot. <laughs> I love it. I would so, like that too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So like all those years I spent chasing snow. Um, I was working in ski resorts. I was working, I worked for a girl guide chalet in Switzerland, which is random because I'm not a girl guide. I was in brownies for like about five minutes as a kid and that like was not for Terry. I was too like, I liked athletic pursuits. Right, more at that right, time. right. So anyways, yeah. Um, I flipped from winter to summer and, uh, when I decided to come back from Oz, there was a number of reasons for that, but certainly the call to home was beckoning. You know, my parents weren't getting, aren't getting younger. I'm the Mm -hmm. eldest. Both my brothers live elsewhere. And uh, so I I did a bunny hop to Western Canada and did a work contract out there. And I thought I might stay because I had spent a lot of years in Western Canada and then decided, no, this isn't for me. The East is really calling. And so I landed back here and life kind of started to line up in a really awesome, unexpected way. So I'm really, really glad I did this. Nice. Being close to my folks is amazing. And, you know, I met a wicked dude out here. It's like all the all the good things are happening. So Awesome. So with, mm-hmm. within all that moving time and travel time, when did you pick macrame back up? Australia. Okay. So, I hadn't been there for all that long, Um, you know, looking to meet people and kind of get out of my comfort zone a little bit, joining different classes and, you know, um, just trying to find things to do that interested me. And then macrame kind of like knocked me upside the head again with a sledgehammer. I was like, hey, remember me? I'm like, oh, yeah, I used to do a lot of you. So, um, you know, I kind of started experimenting with all sorts of different styles and knots and I'm not like I don't really follow the boho trend too much it's Mm kind of not my my interior aesthetic like in my home I'm way more kind of mid-century inspired and I like clean lines and you know geometric shapes and repetitive patterns and things like that but also like kind of like illustrating. So I thought, you know, when the first beast vertical clove hitch piece I did that kind of like implemented an alphabet and something that was totally different that I hadn't seen before um, inspired me in a big way. It wasn't very good, but I was like, I can like draw all over this fiber canvas with, you know, rope. And so that's when my mind started like really expanding into the art and like looking at, you know, the the VCH style. And, you know, it's really evolved a lot since those days. Like, you know, there's a lot of, of folks out there who are picking it up and it's really fun to see, you know, what the imagination can do. <laughs> totally. And it, I mean, it's so cool. It honestly blows my mind. Let me just tell you, because I, I'm thinking about like how opposite it is to like my my style and anything I've ever attempted, I um, because I I ended up like when I was doing macrame a lot, it was mostly like a very boho freeform or I mean somewhat you know a lot of it was symmetric, but it was still very fringy and you know lacy kind of thing. Um, and I have never really attempted like a super clean lined piece the way that you the you know with the kind of work that you do, which is so cool because you bring in like typography and um, I mean it's it's. So the mind blowing part is for me, how much math I have to assume goes into it or how much pre-planning because the pre-planning part is the part that I suck so bad at that I'll go, you know, I can't plan anything. I'm just going to just, I'm going to start nodding and see where it goes. But with your pieces, my assumption is you really have to plan it out ahead of time. It's completely the opposite. And I have the complete opposite, like, feeling about it that you do when I go into a piece without a plan I'm like oh shit I don't know what the what's gonna happen here whereas when I have a plan I'm like the planning part is the hard part the execution is just like no problem it's like I can tell you how many hours it's gonna take me to make it I can tell you how much rope it's gonna take me to make it like I and so for to cost my pieces like from a business perspective I I have a lot of mathematical formulas that I incorporate that right. it's like really simple to elicit like very structured pricing and things like that totally so I like I'm super I would say I'm quite a type a kind of human being I like to you know 
have control over things, I've been told. And so this is just another way for me to kind of have a, a firm hold on what I'm doing and knowing, you know, exactly how big to cut my dowel and, you know, all these calculations are factored into it prior to right. the even beginning. Right. Yeah. And like when I do mock-ups for customers and stuff, like I can show them exactly the palette they want, you know, like yep. we can, we can switch between color palettes to see what's going to, you know, work better and stuff. So yeah. It, and all of these things are things that I just kind of like, because I'm a bit of a computer nerd as well. And I have quite a bit of technical experience, you know, spreadsheeting and all those types of things. Like these are just things that I've developed for myself over the years that mm -hmm. now I'm like, Oh, I bet that these would be helpful for other people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. Know. So when you were kind of embarking on your first, um, let's just like your first like written piece, did you, did you kind of know ahead of time where, how you were going to approach it? Like, or was it, a bit, a, you yeah. know, yeah, like I went into uh, basically the equivalent of Staples in Australia and I bought myself a pad of graph paper and I'm like, okay, this is how I'm going to start with it. And I just kind of started sketching on graph paper, which, you know, not for not, that's basically what it is. Right, right. right. Um, so that that's how I began. And then over the years, you know, when I'm doing more complicated you know, designs and things like that, it's evolved into being a more digital experience, which is a lot easier for me because, you know, if I've got all the alphabets digitized, then it's, you right. know, it's a lot quicker than redrawing things all the time. So I have come up with a lot of shortcuts. For oh, me. I love it. You're, you have a, you have a process. <laughs> I do. <laughs> a very exacting process. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So Straight lines, Cindy, it's all about like, you know, keeping it all, keeping it all together. So that's how my brain works. And like when I see, you know, fiber contemporaries and friends just kind of free flowing, I'm like, oh, that's really cool. Right. How and do, you do that because I am like, I don't find that's where my success is. So, right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a crazy skill in itself. I mean, the uh, for from my perspective, because that's so now the where my how my brain works. Um, but I love mm -hmm. it. I think that's it's amazing. I kind of wish I had more of that brain. Then maybe a lot of my life would be more organized. <laughs> I don't but, know. I think it, it makes parts of life more difficult. To <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't get me wrong here. It's uh, there's pluses and minuses to both for sure. It's interesting <laughs> that you are that you say you are more of a planner though, because um, you know to look at the way that you've like led your led kind of a. You're not a bohemian aesthetic. You don't have a bohemian aesthetic, but you live lived kind of a bohemian lifestyle with all the moving around totally. and experimenting <laughs> yeah. and what you were going to do with your life, you know? So it's funny how yeah, it manifests absolutely. in some ways, but then, you know, yeah. it doesn't in others. <laughs> yeah. Um, but can we talk about your book? Yes, of course. Yes. Please. So you recently launched a book <laughs> called New School Macrame. Um, I haven't... Uh, I'm I'm waiting on my copy, so I can't wait to see it and flip yes, through it. Your copy will come. Here's the copy. Yay, it's so beautiful. I know that cover piece is incredible. So Thank incredible. You. That was one of my like kind of OG large scale pieces, like from back in the day. You nice. know, probably when I think Bridie might have featured that one on your page back in the day. And, yeah, uh, yeah. It was kind of the first big hit. You know what I mean? The one that like kind of launched the. the the Instagram and all the things. So, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so what are you yeah. showing people in the book? Are you doing like step by step how to do s certain projects? Is it does it strictly focus on, um, you know, your sort of uh, clove hitch style? Yeah, it, it's the first book of its kind that's entirely rooted in vertical clove hitch. Okay. So I'm not I'm not teaching anything about, you know, square knot pieces or, you know, more bohemian style at all. It's completely VCH. Nice. Um, and so when I was approached by my publisher, they're called David and Charles, they're a boutique, um, they're a boutique publisher out of the UK, and they deal mainly with with craft books. So it was fun working with them because their breadth of experience is like enormous in the crafting world. Mm -hmm. And they had worked with a couple of gals uh, from the Gold Coast producing macrame books, you know. So like in and looking at their collection, I'm like, okay, I know that person. I, I've seen their work and whatever. I'm like, okay, I feel good about this. So we put together a meeting and had a big discussion about it. And they made me an offer and off we went with it. So nice. that was kind of another part of me moving back to Nova Scotia was to be, you know, in a landed in a place where I could focus just on the book. Mm -hmm. And so I moved in with my parents for six months and wrote it. 
Nice. Um, but the coolest part about that was is the book, the house that my folks live in now is the house that I learned how to macrame in because that used to be my grandparents' house. Oh, that's so there's so a little nice. bit of a nostalgia element there. Yeah, yeah. So that was pretty cool. Um, Mom took real good care of me, kept me fed and watered. And after my manuscript was done, it was like, all right, I'm going to go find a house now. <laughs> Thanks, God. <laughs> um, so, anyways, back to the book itself, though. Um, basically, it, it's sectioned out in. Um, in different areas. So there's like a technique section where I teach you everything that you're going to need to know for the project section. So, you know, like, like how to start a piece, how to finish a piece, how to add colors, you know, how to carry rope, different things, different techniques that, you know, I kind of had to come up with by myself mm -hmm. back in the day because there was nothing like this available to learn from. Um, and my grandma was a super talented fiber artist. So, you know, she crocheted a lot and taught herself a lot of different techniques and created different things. So, you know, like in the process of making bracelets, she'd be like, well, why don't you try doing this? And, you know, so some of this stuff we kind of came up with together, I suppose. Nice. But anyways, there's 10 full projects start to finish, um, materials list all the way down to, you know, the end fringe. And then I offer a pattern library where there's over 100 grids. So literally, you know, once you've got the skill. Uh oh, hold on. Go ahead and create any of those different types of projects. Because like, for example, there's a denim jacket project in there, but you could take anything from the back of the book, you know, from the grid section and make it into a denim jacket just right, by right. changing the way you start and finish it. So I kind of tried to do it in a way where it's like there's multiple uses for the different patterns and grids and right, things like right. that. So Cool. So how was yeah. the process for you of writing it? That's the word. <laughs> uh, I love to write. Um, yeah, I enjoy spending time doing and you know writing a book was kind of bucket list for me but I didn't know it was going to be about this I thought I was going to write a crazy book about my life one day maybe I <laughs> hope you do <laughs> that's what I've been told by a couple of friends they're like we just can't wait to read the book this one <laughs> go on about your life um anyways no the book came out in the form of a macrame manual which was completely unexpected to me it was definitely not something that I had ever considered and you know here we are it was fun it was good you know, ups and downs for sure. Some days were super frustrating. You'd start a project that you thought was going to work and it's like, okay, fuck, that's not going to happen. Scrap, start again, you know. Right. Um, and then you're doing these things on deadlines too um, because there's a team of people waiting for various aspects of it to keep the ball rolling. Right. How, know, wait, so how did that go? Like, uh, like how were your deadlines set up for you? Like you had to submit so, five projects or, you know, how did it go? Yeah. So there was like, there were three or four different main deadlines. And so the first one was kind of like, they wanted the, a knot guide, they wanted a couple of projects, and they wanted some uh, grids done so that they could start designing those sections of the book. So then when the rest was done, it was like a little more of a free flow, mm -hmm. you know, sectioning it out. And so you know, that was fun, too, because the initial meetings with the publisher were a lot about aesthetic. And, you know, we have multiple Pinterest boards behind the scenes where it's like, these are some of the ways I like to see things photographed. And, you know, I have a bit of a photography background as well, because I used to have a, you know, a small business back in the day. So, you know, I'm probably a little pickier about certain things than yeah. maybe others when it comes to the aesthetic. So, you know, we were back and forth a lot on that. I did do most of the photography in the book as well. Oh, wow. Um, all the step-by-step -step work was, I did myself. Uh, Michaela from String Theories is a good buddy of mine and she lives down the road. So she helped me with a few things. Just oh, nice. like, you know, snapping I love her. the shutter on the camera. Oh yeah, Michaela's a legend. So, and she's doing cool stuff now too. It's fun seeing all these awesome things happen in the community. But um, anyways, yeah, then all of the work got packaged up and sent over to the UK and they did all of the stylized shots. They rented an Airbnb mm -hmm. for a few days that, you know, we all pre-approved because it had the vibe we were looking for. And uh, a, a team went in and styled it and did all the rest of the shots. So, so it cool. cool. <laughs> it's kind of crazy to hear yeah. that, um, that uh, like that macrame is not a full time job for you because it sounds like the bookmaking and all that had. I mean, I guess it, 
maybe because of what was going on with COVID, it gave you the time. Um, but you know, yeah, you're, you- I was definitely working on a lot of orders mm-hmm. while doing the book. Um, but I wasn't traveling with the other gigs. So that like alleviated a lot of my time to be able to you know, full time focus on both of these things. Um, but I have had times when macrame has been full time. Um, I'm not going to lie right now, things have quieted down like across the board for yeah. a lot of people, myself included. But I do have other irons in the fire. And so, you know, I just kind of ebb and flow wherever the work is, I kind of go with it. So that's great. I mean, to be honest, I'm like wondering, I'm sitting here wondering, <laughs> I have been for a, a while, like, do I need to go back into an office job? I don't know, <laughs> you know. So I'm, yeah, I'm like sort of in the that supply side. I, I have no idea. Like, are you guys still? Are you seeing things slow down? Like, we oh, are, huge or? slowdown. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And it, it it goes hand in hand, right? So if like if you if the makers can't totally. sell it, then you know, then they're not going to be buying fiber, you know. So yeah. it's interesting to hear because yeah. I. I I have been curious what it's like. I have been talking to more. I've been even on the podcast. I've been talking to people who supply. So then we're kind of sharing how it's been um, the past few months. Like it was weird because during COVID, obviously, a lot of people had picked up new hobbies. So there were, you know, I mean, it was gangbusters at the time. Um, And I knew that wasn't going to last forever. But it feels now and I should probably be smarter and look at the numbers between like, you know, 20. 18 and 19 versus now um you know sure. just because obviously 2020 was an anomaly 2021 too but um yeah, yeah. no i feel a like huge slowdown in a lot of ways it was bad oh, for sure but, yeah you know, there were definite positives from it yeah yeah you, you make hay while the sun shines yeah. right <laughs> that's it that's it 100%. yeah so you know now that travel is going to start up again I've got a lot of travel work scheduled for next year and uh so you know whatever happens with the fiber art I'm just kind of here for it yeah you know I feel like talking about Instagram that's really where I've enjoyed a lot of my you know success in terms of finding great customers and a great community and lots of good folks to collaborate with and you know kind of share the wealth with Mm -hmm. and uh I don't know. I find the platform has changed a bit. So quite a bit. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not as compelled to like, I don't know, be on there. Like there. I know. Same, yeah. same. It's, it's sad. Like I wish we could go back to where it was just like discovering people yeah. and photos and, um, you know, yeah. I can't, like I was scrolling through yesterday <laughs> and my whole feed was like a bunch of people I don't follow, but who are not even people I would care to. Like it was like outside of, the fiber realm too. So I was like, what's happening? What is going on with my Instagram? Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 And I mean, like right now I'm at a point with, uh, like I do a lot of made to order work. Mm -hmm. So it kind of becomes a little bit like production too. It's, you know, people pick a piece that they already like and I change the colors if they want and off we go. So it makes it hard to um, show new work a lot too, because I'm not making tons of new work at the moment. Right. You know, do people also and order so, like fr- like their own phrases and stuff? Like if they want yeah. you to do a, yeah. a non fuck work? <laughs> Anything and everything. Like I recently did a really cool one that's like a Tribe Called Quest lyric. Oh, cool. You know, stuff like that. I, I have a couple of cool sobriety pieces that I make that are like symbolic and, yeah. you know, people buy those and they're. It, it, I love bringing to like whatever people bring to me, basically. Awesome. Um, and a lot of my popular work has come from custom work. And, you know, I love <laughs> I love tapping into the sense of humor of other people because, you know, if somebody else finds it funny, it's somebody else is going to find it funny. Too. Yeah, totally. So, <laughs> yeah. Like the where are my fucking scissors? That was that's like, such a good one. It's really. Oh, my God. It was the cutest girl from Guatemala and her and I were chatting a ton she's like I'd love it if you'd make me this I'm like oh yeah I'm gonna make that for sure (laughs) so I made one and posted it and I think it's probably like by far my best selling piece like by dozens yeah (laughs) yeah many of those now god we all feel that every time I make one yeah it's It's so good it's so good um (laughs) uh do you want care to talk about your sobriety journey I mean, from uh, my standpoint, I'm a, I'm a little curious about it, but I, you know, you share what you want to share. Um, no, I'm pretty open. Well, also, and you're, honestly. you're in the event world too. So I guess I wonder, is it, is it difficult to be in that, um, to be in that industry you and know. have 
Yeah. No, it's better. Yeah. It's better now <laughs> because, you know, if you spent a few hours after finishing work having a few too many drinks, it makes the next day very difficult and yeah, long and arduous anyway. Um, and, you know, there is a massive drinking culture in that type of work for mm-hmm. sure. And, uh, you know, concerts, events, galas, you know, we do kind of a lot of that kind of thing. And I think my life is a lot easier. Nice. <laughs> I get to sleep at a better hour. I get better, better sleep. sleep. Yeah. For sure. and, yeah. Yeah. And I like, I was never like a, you know, crack a drink at the end of every day kind of drinker. It was just kind of became something in my life that I felt wasn't serving me anymore, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and uh, I had bigger aspirations for myself than looking down the neck of a bottle of wine. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> was there a aha moment for you where you were just like, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore yeah, and I'm done. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I was living in Oz and uh, it's, you know, in Canada, we have quite a big drinking culture. Australia definitely does as well. And I had a night where I blacked out because mm-hmm. I drank so much. And, you know, binge drinking was not uncommon among my group of friends. So it never felt like it was odd to do that. And but no, I, I mean, I can't like that before. Just to, I mean, to be totally yeah. candid, I mean, there are so many nights where I blacked out. So I'm like, oh, how? why was that one night different yeah. for you? Like, it, was that your first night blacking yeah. out? Like the first time um, it happened to you? Like- Hold on, you're frozen. Just felt Hold on, you're more, frozen. More uncomfortable than ever before. You know, that hardcore, like, toilet of doom anxiety. Like, oh, my God. Like, yeah, maybe maybe I'm just going to take 30 days and just chill out a bit, you know? And after 30 days, I was like, yeah, I'm going to do another 30. I feel pretty good. Like, fuck, that feels really good, actually. And yeah. then 60 days goes by, and I'm like, damn, girl. 30 more let's do 30 more and then after 90 days I was just kind of like nah, why, yeah good. like why would you go back and, yeah uh, yeah and you know like I had taken breaks before who does and it's like oh dry January or whatever or sober October or whatever they call those things and uh yeah I mean I, I guess at, at the end of the day if something isn't like improving your life you know it costs money it costs brain cells it costs sleep it, mm-hmm. you know it causes you know all sorts of anxiety totally. and like regrets and I would uh I would never I'd never go back now. yeah I mean good for you, you know it's just yeah it doesn't have a place anymore so I'm happy about that yeah good that's good for you um I went through a period where I was like yeah. um right after having I mean not right after having kids I guess it was more like I don't know. I kind of drank a lot through my 20s. And then, yeah, I guess after having kids, it was like I found, oh, and it was, it no, it was this. It was quitting my job and then doing macrame full time. And I had all this freedom. So then I, I realized I started drinking like yeah. every day. And it was like, a, and then it would turn, like mm-hmm. a glass turn into two and then two and a half and then three. And yeah. then it was a bottle. And you'd be like, wait, what happened? You know, and it's just gone. How and, did that happen? Yeah. <laughs> like so easily too, though. Like so easily. And, um, yeah. So I remember that, I don't know, I guess it was probably like 2017. And I just like, I realized I was like, I'm drinking so much. What is happening? And that was right before we moved um, to the country where we are now. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. So I've gone through my periods of of sobriety where it's like, I'll go, you know, where I've gone like a month or two months even. I think I went four months before the pandemic. And then a month into the pandemic, I'm like, I'm still have, I still haven't drank. I haven't drank. And then I was like, why not? Why not just have one? And then it was like slippery slope, slippery slope. And it's like now I drink, but like not not anything to excess like it was. But I still wonder. I like still kind of want to get rid of it. But it's but there's always those times where I'm just like, oh, but one is nice. You know, like one or two is nice. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. even one or two does affect my sleep. That's the part that I hate the most where I'm like, yeah. but I'm still waking up at 3 a.m., you know. So yeah. I don't know. It's just one of those and, things. You know, like. I spent a lot of time going down the rabbit hole of, you know, reading about the experiences specifically of other women mm-hmm. listening I, to I have too. Have you heard like Laura McCowan and, and like oh um, my God, all her stuff? Amazing. She has a piece of my macrame actually. Does she really? <laughs> Laura oh and Holly. Oh yeah. my God, that's yeah. awesome. Like, like, I was so sad when they quit that TV. podcast. <laughs> Oh, have oh you listened to it? Yeah, yeah, that one and never. Spiritualish, like her next one I listened to. And Spiritualish, I yeah. loved too. I was really sad when her and Metal quit that. 
Yeah. Yeah. I did listen to quite a bit of that as well. And, you know, I've followed Meadow for a long time too. Um, yeah, but it, it's interesting because, you know, back in those days, they were just on the tail end of doing home. And that was like, that was my religion, like mm-hmm. home podcast. Was, I know I went through away. that was actually the time that I was going through all this too and I like I binged the whole thing I would be like packing orders and listening to like every single episode that they've done yeah, yeah it was amazing same same so and then I went I've read so many good books and you know there's so many authors that have focused on you know specifically like the way that big alcohol targets women Mm -hmm. and you know the way that it kind of happened and you know when you kind of know some of the nuts and bolts of the psychology behind the marketing and stuff it gets pretty ugly yeah yeah mommy wine culture is the same with cigarette smoking back in the day totally like i believe at some point we will get there with drinking where it's like you know we will look at alcohol the same way we look at cigarettes you know maybe not in our lifetime but i think it'll happen at some point yeah it's and slow. I, mean, I think it's slowly it's starting like to, yeah. Their own. You know, this is just how I uh, choose to proceed with life now, and that's all good. Yeah. Is your boyfriend sober also? Yeah. Nice. That's good. Yeah. He's the first dude I've ever dated that's sober, and I didn't realize how important that was. To yeah. Me. Yeah. I bet. Yeah. It's interesting because my husband doesn't, he barely drinks. Like if he drinks at all, he'll have like one beer and like he just doesn't like the out of control thing. Like that feeling that I yeah. seek is what he doesn't want. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Which is also funny because he's Russian and I'm like, how, what, how, how does that work out? I don't understand. <laughs> that math doesn't Seriously. quite compute. <laughs> Yeah, right. Uh, like yeah. Being from Eastern Canada, it's kind of the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, but I'm I'm so glad like you're on, you know, that you've been able to be successful with that because it does, I, you know, even from my month or two or three or four months of, of not drinking, it, it does make a huge difference and you feel so good. Well, and not only just like in my quality of life, in my quality of creativity and the way that the ideas flow and the time that I make available for doing creative things, you know, like booze can be a real buzz kill. Like even though you're getting a buzz, it's killing your buzz. Yeah. You know? like, yeah. It takes a lot of time to, to do it. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's a demotivator. Yeah. And so I don't want that, you know, like I, there's only so much life to live. Like I want to do it in the best way I can. So. Yeah. Hundred yeah, percent. Screw the booze. It's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so what do yeah. you feel like um you know, what do you feel like you want to do next in your life? Oh, we're frozen again. Did you hear did you Sorry, hear my question? Cindy, you cut out there. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know you got Come frozen back. too. Yeah. Um your next chapter of life, how would you like it to sort of unfold? Do you have a plan for it or are you just kind of riding the wave? I kind of a little bit of both, you know, like I'm calculated, but I kind of like also let things unfold somewhat because I'm kind of a believer that, you know, what's coming is coming. It's whether you're ready for it or not. Yeah. (laughs) And so, you know, you can orchestrate a lot of things, but oftentimes in my life when I've been the big orchestrator of things, that's kind of when it hasn't always worked out the way (laughs) it probably would have if I had just let things flow a bit. So trying to relax into things a little bit more, especially now that I'm kind of here, what I would consider to be my real home. Um, Definitely I'm here to, you know, spend a lot more time with, with family Mm -hmm. and uh, business wise, you know, I have a a lot of ideas for time went on creative. Now that I've kind of opened, you know, Pandora's box into teaching via the book, you know, like, when I lived in Australia, I taught a lot of of classes and Mm -hmm. workshops and stuff. And I could see coming back to that, because it also taps into like my personal training background, you know, teaching boot camps. And I like, I like teaching groups and teaching people. It's fun. So uh, how I, how I'm going to do that exactly is still the big question. You know, yeah. there's quite a few really cute local spaces in this province that would love to host workshops and stuff like that. So, you know, that keeps it tight and local, but I think there's a big world out there and there's lots of possibilities and how I can deliver you take know, it on the, road. the message about what take, I do. Yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. sure you can take your, what you do on the road for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So whether it's that or, you know, virtual um, kits, patterns, you know, I I definitely have a lot of things in the hopper. It's just to have other contract work in the hopper, too. So it's finding the time to 
make it all work right. well. Yeah, <laughs> so I know. That's, that's the trick, right? Time is, yeah. yeah. Time is the uh, ultimate question mark here, I guess, you know? But yeah. Yeah. And I don't have kids, so I can't imagine like what a lot of the, what a lot of the makers out there, you know, how much more infringed upon their time is by just having a family in the day to day. So, hey, big hats off to how some of the folks out there are making it work. But yeah, here we are. Um, Do you think kids factor into your future at all? I did notice and I'll, I'll say up front that, you know, there was a piece that you did with the endometriosis. And, you know, I know you had a hysterectomy. So obviously not your own biological kids, but any interest in adopting or fostering? No. No. Smart girl. (laughs) No, I'm well into my 40s now. And uh, if I was going to do that, that having kids is a a young woman's job. (laughs) Uh, Sorry. Not all the time. (laughs) Ideally. No. Ideally. Yeah. Um, (laughs) But... No, you know what? I I never really wanted to. Yeah. Ever. It's never really been something that I was focused on. Um, I think I'm just a big kid myself. So it's like having a hard enough time keeping track of myself. I feel <laughs> the same way, and I've got two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're a brave woman uh, or just dumb i don't know <laughs> you leave it all the chance and see what happens and things happen you know yeah. but yeah 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 no i i suffered a lot with endometriosis yeah. over the years and the thought of like suffering <laughs> more because uh-huh. of having a child i you know there were doctors who were like oh it might help blah 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 i'm like no, no, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> it's not happen. So, so when yeah. did you, so was that an issue for you? Like since puberty, were you having, did you have like painful cramp, like painful periods? And, uh, you know, it, it over the years, it kind of ebbed and flowed. That's mm-hmm. like hard than that fun. It was, um, it was more as I got older, um, I had a copper IUD inserted at one point and that was the beginning of the end. Oh. Um, I, you know, I, I did that. I was trying to do the responsible thing. Oh, they're awful. Like it was, it was horrendous. Yeah. And so that started a litany of surgeries and painkillers and various things that led to other issues and even after you had it taken out well after i had yes oh wow yeah because by the time i had it taken out the endo was like in full force um i was like not doing well it was affecting my quality of life significantly and um yeah finally i found a gynecologist in the town that i was living in that was like yo we need to get this thing out of you yeah yes we do because as a younger woman it, it's very hard to have a conversation with a gynecologist about having a hysterectomy because they're like well what if right I'm like right. it's my body yeah and you're like no no out, no yeah you know i'm not having kids i'm not going to change my mind um i'm very headstrong <laughs> yeah so, anyways i did all the natural things and everything that i thought could possibly you know help solve the problem and none of it did so right. um, in the end, I made the right decision for me and I found a doctor who agreed. So good. Yeah. Good for you. And uh, but that was also a part of the reason I quit drinking back in the day. It did mm-hmm. have to do, you know, with the repercussions of the sugar and alcohol and how it can really affect your endometriosis, like on the list of symptoms and things you shouldn't do. That's quite high up there. Oh, right. And so, you know, that was also like kind of like a little bird chirping in my ear going you know this might help if you just kind of try this right and it didn't completely thwart the the issues but it certainly helped my mental state Mm -hmm. so yeah it kind of was hand in hand a bit there yeah it's so crazy those iud's um like the I mean, I guess a lot of people have them and they have no problems, but like, I don't actually have like, you know, cramp issues or anything that I was just using it after I had my second kid. I had a Mirena. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't a copper one, but um, I mean, a week after it was in, I was like, it was like yeast infection, infection after yeast infection, after bacterial Awful. infection. I mean, it was like constant. And I was like, this is obviously from that. And then the doctors were like, no, no, it's not. It's not. Yeah. I'm like, hello. I've never had any issues down there in my whole entire life. And now I am after this thing is in me, get it out. 
So we took yeah. that out. And then well, your body, yeah, she doesn't, it didn't your body want it. doesn't want that shit. Mm-mm. It's like rejecting it. It's like, how many more things do I need to do to you before you listen to me? Totally. Right? Yep. And yeah. it was like immediately the problems culture where it's like, take a pill, take a pill, take a pill, do this, whatever. We'll put a band aid and another band aid. Like now you're getting to the grass yeah. of how I feel about certain things. Totally. But, you know, there's only so many band aids you can put on something before it's like, okay, we got to get you got to go to the source. It. Yeah, you got to go to the source <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So, wow. So after you went through that procedure, how were you feeling? Life changed so much for the better like oh my god I can remember after the first couple of months looking back you know it was quite a it was quite a healing process it's not like you just you know jump up to the hospital and you're done like there's weeks of Mm -hmm. recovery um but it was like so much less pain and you know not having to go out with like an extra pair of pants all the time in my bed you know like just that kind of stuff right I used to have to have bags of iron pumped into me because I was so anemic. Really? Like it was just, oh it was so it's a lot of bleeding. Time. Like I, yeah, I don't I actually, bad. you know, come to think of it, yeah. I don't quite know exactly what endometri- endometriosis does to a body. So oh, yeah, well, a lot of things and different things to different women. But for me, it was like excessive hemorrhage, bleeding, excessive pain, um, like just that kind of stuff. Yeah. And in the end, it was like my body can't regenerate, you know, the amount of blood loss, iron it needs by eating food and stuff it, because I'm just losing so much blood. So, right. so anyways, yeah, it was definitely, uh, it was definitely a positive thing for me to do. And I know there's various, you know, stories both ways, you know, some women don't get the relief. Some women can't believe they hadn't done it, you know, 20 years earlier. And I'm, that's kind of how I feel. I'm mm-hmm. like, oh man, I feel like I've been given another lease on life because that's awesome. I just don't live in pain like for 10 or 12 days a month. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. I'm so glad it was successful for you. I, I mean, it's hard to believe Same. that yeah. people can go through that pro- that procedure and not have relief from it. I mean, that's, that's so sad. I mean, it just well, seems it, like it does fix endometriosis for everyone because having your uterus removed doesn't necessarily remove all of the endo because it's not all inside or outside the uterus it can be in your like in your body and I still have some like I have some on my bladder TMI or whatever Uh, there's no TMI here but Um, that they can never take out So like, because I still have ovaries, the estrogen can still like, kind of like pour gasoline on the endometriosis fire and light it up. I've just so far been lucky that I haven't had any other issues. Right. Did you have to do any kind of like hormone replacement? Carry on eating well, taking good care of myself. That's it? I haven't needed to because I still have my ovaries. Okay. I see. So that uh, certainly helps. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I have friends who have had full hysterectomies, which includes ovaries, and okay. that's a totally different I see. scenario because then you have, like, unless you've already been through um, menopause and stuff like that, then you definitely go down the road of hormone replacement, and that can be a fucking nightmare as well. Right. So I'm glad that I didn't have to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's something we can all look forward to in about 15, 20 years. You know, <laughs> I think about it, I'm like, oh it. no. And I'm like, just like, get it over with. I know. Well, and even even now, even now with being like um, for me, almost mid 40s and I'm like, you know, you sort of kind of feel perimenopause coming on and it's like, you know, I don't know, just the emotional and the hormonal effects of it all. It's like, I don't know, I'm going to I'm going to be a mess in 15 years or 10 years or whatever it is, you know. Yeah. Ah, And everybody's different. You don't know what to expect until it's like on top of you basically so yeah. it's like just buckle up i know <laughs> I hope it'll be okay <laughs> you know fun future yeah. <laughs> yeah but definitely a lot of a lot of these uh things in my life have definitely influenced my art for sure <laughs> no definitely yeah. i know you know it's funny i was gonna ask I've like i was gonna ask like does the does the representation of you on instagram match the person who you are inside like <laughs> Is it all fucks all the time or is it, you know, but actually, 
<laughs> I kind of I kind of love that it matches. That it's not like just a gimmick. You know what I mean? No, it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, I, you're, I, you're, I, you are your authentic I, self for sure. Oh my god! And you know, like one of my very dear friends, um, Janice Ledwell Hunt from Unfettered Co. Um, she has a PhD in English, and back in the day when you know she was kind of coaching me about caption writing. We used to talk a lot about Instagram and how, you know, how to get the word out there efficiently. And this was right. way back when people still wrote captions and read captions and took photos. You right. know, the good old days. Yeah. And she's like, Terry, for the love of God, would you please just start writing your captions the way you talk to me? I was like, really? <laughs> I'm allowed to do that? I know. <laughs> Oh my God. Okay. So then that's when the shenanigans really started and it worked. I'm like, okay, I can really attribute to some of that writing success to that one very minute WhatsApp conversation. I was still living in Australia then. She's like, for the love of God, just write the way you speak. And I'm like, yeah. Okay. That's a green light for shenanigans. Yes. And so, yeah, definitely. It's awesome. I am full of my mom has always said oh you're full of beans like you're just a little you know marching by the dream the <laughs> how does it go marching to the beat of your own drummer right. yes that right, would be right, right. yeah definitely full of facts full of shenanigans full of silliness it's all legit <laughs> <laughs> yeah i love it <laughs> i know because you wonder <laughs> nowadays right if you don't get to know the full person on Instagram, we see so very little, in, you know, in many cases, but it's like, you know, yeah, you wonder just, who, you know, I don't know if the person behind the work represents, truly represents totally. you know, what they're showing. So, you know, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. You're a cool chick. <laughs> <laughs> Cindy, you're pretty cool too. Oh, thanks. No, I mean it's weird. I'm From watching the color changes of the hair. Oh. <laughs> well, I, I feel like this is the only way I can express myself nowadays. But um, no, but it's weird because being on the on the like supply side because I, I'm not making so much anymore. I'm like it's so weird how stifling it's been. Like I don't know because it's like I you know I don't want to choose sides and I don't want to be political or I don't want to you know there's all these ways to not I don't know <laughs> to just like because I don't want to rock any boats so it's like it's been really weird it's been a weird like line to have to draw um yeah you know I mean uh, with a bunch of things not just politi- politics it's like even like taking a stance on people's art and there's a copying issue and da 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 and there's so many people who come oh, to me and God. go that person copied me and that this person and I'm like ah, I don't know I'm not I'm not the police person on <laughs> on Instagram like I share work if I see it yeah. and it looks nice and I'm so sorry if it's kind of like derivative of your work and you know it's it's hard to I don't know I don't know what I'm saying anymore <laughs> I'm just rambling no now, but, but. It, that's a really tricky topic as well and like yeah. when you first start out like you're all you you're it's pretty innocent you want to learn yeah see something yeah. cool I'm gonna make it Maybe you don't have other friends in the fiber world to kind of like coach you and guide you as to what's kind of quote unquote well, right and wrong, which is of course can be quite subjective as well. Right. But you know, it's like I used to have a real sticky spot about my work being copied and it, it felt like a personal hit. And mm-hmm. it's like it used to really upset me. Um because I was trying to find my way as well and like carve out my little niche right. and what have you. So, you know, I probably had some conversations with folks back in the day that I wouldn't even entertain now because I'm just right. like, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. It's like, it's all in a book now. So, <laughs> you know, I, I kind of have taken that foray or I've chosen that that path and it'll be what it'll be now. Right, so right. it's certainly not something that I spend really any time thinking about or worrying about. It's like, you know, been there, done that. And I think I've learned my lesson from it. I hope that other people have learned from me as well, because yeah. I would never come at somebody from any malicious perspective or with any malicious intent. It would always be kind of like speak the way that I'd want to be spoken to. Mm-hmm. So it was more, you know, an educational conversation or I hope that that's that would always be what I would endeavor to do yeah um yeah. and you know like I'm still buddies with some people who initially copied my work because we did end up having great conversations and learning from each other and yeah. stuff like that. 
So, you know, I mean, that is the best. That's such a good, it's a good way to approach it, you know, to see what positives can come out of it. You know, it's really hard to see that in the, in the moment, I think, but hindsight, (laughs) hindsight's definitely 2020. A hundred percent. And, you know, it, it kind of is what it is. And, you know, like we've been around in the fiber world for a while now, and it, your eye becomes a little bit more attuned to, you know, what's been out there for a while. So, you know, it's very easy to look through my Instagram feed and be like, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. That one looks like that one. That one looks like, you know, right, and it's right. just, who's going to come up with the next big original thing that everybody's going to latch on to. It's kind of like one of those, right? Yeah. I know it's hard because I think, you know, some people are in the school of like, well, there is no original, there's nothing original and we're all derivative of something else, which could be true, but also might not, but it's just different. Yeah. It's different when someone's doing an exact, an exact Mm -hmm. copy. That's, I think that's most, most people's real big hangups, which I get, I a hundred percent get. Yeah. But yeah, you know. And you know, like just, I, I've had lots of people ask me as well, like, hey, would you mind if I did this? It's a gift for so-and-so or whatever. And it's like, you know, those are hard questions to answer Mm -hmm. because, you know, it's like one of those you give an inch, take a mile situations. Or am I going to see this on your Etsy account later? And, you know, that's often what has transpired where it's like, you know, so-and-so sends me so-and-so's work and it's for sale on such and such website. Right, right. And, you know, that that's kind of like a line crossing in in my opinion. Yeah. Um, but you know, if you're making something for learning purposes or for personal use or whatever, like just, you know, be smart about how you're displaying it for yeah. people yeah. and stuff like that. Well, I mean, now that you have a book, <laughs> I wonder, I mean, that I, I feel like that has to organically in a way change the way you yeah. approach it now, because it is all there for people to learn and create. Totally. So, yeah. 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 And I mean, I'm not saying, you know, I'm keen to see people, you know, flipping through my Instagram page and, you know, making the work that I've made yeah. because I have written a whole book of other things that, you know, it's there for you to make. Yeah. And there's like 20 alphabets in this book. So you can oh, write wow. whatever the fuck you want. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, there's lots of different things that can be done. And the possibilities are quite frankly endless. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm excited to see folks take this information and do their own shit with it. Yeah, like, totally. I think that's going to be super cool. Mind you, I did see a gal the other day. Um, she started nodding up the panel for the jean jacket. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, <laughs> like, I can't. Like, Yay! Like, one day, just be walking down the road and see somebody wearing one. Like, it'll be the coolest thing. Ever. Like, that's yeah, right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. But I was wearing mine at a at a market last weekend, and uh, I had a couple people go, oh, "That's a jacket." Oh, nice! <laughs> that's that's awesome. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh yeah. My gosh. I can't part with that one. Certain projects I can't part with. That's one yeah, really cool. yeah, yeah. No, never. Yeah. Um. So, where can people get the book? The book is sold pretty much anywhere that you like to buy books. Okay. Um, I've kind of gone down the rabbit hole of looking at various vendors and I pretty much every site that I've hit on, it's there. Um, the only one, you won't see it translated yet. There's some deals for that in the works currently. Mm-hmm. Um, so for now, it's in English pretty much anywhere. You know, the big awesome. box stores, you guys, Barnes and Noble and Amazon, Amazon. And, you know, yeah. Oak Depository and all watersons in the uk like it's in pretty well everywhere indigo awesome um but hopefully it'll be in other languages in the next year or two as well very so. cool oh my gosh well i yeah. cannot wait to get my hands on a copy and um mm-hmm. finally try this mathematical <laughs> approach to math <macro-ray. laughs> <Right, Terry. laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have questions. I have questions. <laughs> yeah. um, and and I'm here for the questions. Like I have had, you know, some fun DM conversations with folks who have received the book and, you know, are like, um, what do you think about this or whatever? Like I'm here for that until it becomes, you know, overwhelming. But uh, for now, I'm certainly here for questions. So happy to help. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Terry, again, for chatting with me. This is very enlightening. And I really cannot wait because I really want to try my own my own phrases in my own house and see what happens. It's going to be a mess. I don't know. It's going to be a mess. (laughs) 
Uh, you've got skills. Okay. <laughs> it's all about tension. You just keep the tension consistent, and okay. that's kind of the biggest secret I can give you. Awesome. All right. We'll do. Yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you so much again. And you guys go check out her book, New School Macrame. Um, and again, where online can people find you? They can find me at w www.tywinoncreative.com that's my website um, and there is actually a, a page um, you'll see it at the top banner that links to a page with all sorts of links to the book awesome. so various different places that they can buy it it's also in the link tree on my Instagram which is at Tywin on Creative. Facebook kind of the same I don't do as much over there these days but uh, I'm there and uh, yeah there's a couple other fun little secret things going on behind the scenes right now that you know there might be more of me out in the world at some point Ooh. for you to learn from uh, nothing so you can announce yet teaser. No. Boo. no but, <laughs> but y'all will be the first ones to know when it comes yeah all right group. well we'll be following and you know following along and look forward yeah. to the news <laughs> All right. Yay. Thanks again, Terry. Thanks, Cindy. It's been really wonderful chatting with you. Check the show notes of each episode to get the website and Instagram for each of the fiber artists I speak with. Be sure to give them a follow. And you can view video from this podcast on naromastudio.com slash the fiber artist podcast. If you enjoy the fiber artist podcast, go to Apple Podcasts to subscribe, rate, and review. Thank you for listening.